Okay, wonderful. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, this is going to be a public talk. Uh, we're going to be doing these monthly at the beginning of the month, every Sunday. Um, next month, they will be from 11 to 12. They'll be one hour long, so keep an eye out for that. Um, today, we're actually being led by Bhikshuni Lozong Yunten, who is an American-born Buddhist nun who's been practicing since 1994, and she was ordained in 2003. I'm going to give you a little bit of a backdrop for some of you who are unfamiliar with her teachings or have not received a teaching from her. She's incredible. She moved to Chen Resig Institute in Australia and studied intensely under um, Kenza Rinpoche Geshe Tashi Sering. He's the Larampa Geshe from Sarah J Monastery and the former abbot of Gyume Kenza, um, excuse me, Gyume Tantric College. Um, she studied with him intensely from about 2002 to 2009. Uh, she then went on to study and retreat and offer service at Dharma centers across the world, becoming an in-depth registered teacher within the FPMT, um, which is a foundation uh, for the preservation of the Mahayana tradition. And that was in 2012, she became an in-depth registered teacher. We're very blessed to have her. She's actually been a resident teacher at multiple centers, including Kusong Yeshi Retreat Center in Australia and Mahamudra Center in New Zealand as well. So LMB is super blessed now to be able to say that she's one of our very own resident teachers. Um, and we request even at the beginning of the teaching for you to continue to teach and teach and teach and teach um, for all of the students here at LMB. We're super blessed to have you. So thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Christina, and uh, thanks to LMB. So welcome, folks. We're both online and uh, in person. So if you see my attention divided, that's the reason why. Um, and just a couple people getting sorted. So we'll just uh, let them arrive and get themselves in for. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, the volume is my voice. <laughs> so I will speak loudly. <laughs> um, if I speak about this level, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. If you need to, sco if you need to scoot in, that's all right. That was just for the announcements. Yep. Yep, thanks folks. We'll start in one second. So um, I heard your name said, but would you please spell it? Uh, Y-O-N-T-E-N, -E umlauts over the O. Y-O-U-N-T-E-N? Uh, Y-O-N-T-E-N, yep. So yun like rhymes with moon, ten like the number ten. Mm -hmm. Yun ten. <laughs> Random housekeeping. It's nice to see you folks on Zoom. If you feel comfortable to have your videos on, that would be wonderful. Um, if you're feeling shy or you're in your pajamas or something, that's okay too. But if you feel like you can have your videos on, I would appreciate it just so I can see your faces. And uh, the Gompa people can see your faces on the screen next to me. So just so you know. All right. Everybody in? Yeah, Jessica, everybody in? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're going to be talking about kind of the intersection between daily life and Dharma practice from the perspective of social activism and environmental activism and the deep inner work that we're trying to do, whether we're Buddhist or we're just someone who identifies as on a spiritual path, whether we're a secular humanist, whether we're an atheist, but we really value ethics. How do you marry up the deep inner work with the outer work? So in order to talk about that, I think it's really important to do the Buddhist tradition of setting our motivation. So if you want to just take a minute and sit comfortably, if it feels okay to close your eyes, go ahead and do that. And we'll just take a moment and set a very strong altruistic motivation for this session. So coming aware of your body. Feeling very present in your space. And then check in with your mind. And thinking to yourself, whatever my initial reasons were for coming to a talk like this, whether it was curiosity or boredom, whether it was deep interest, 
may I elevate that motivation and think, I'm going to think through these thoughts and engage with these ideas, not just for my own welfare or entertainment, but so that there's a positive ripple effect around me. May these ideas benefit all sentient beings. May the energy of these thoughts lead all of us to developing our fullest potential. And so you can reframe that in words that resonate with you, but just take a moment and really adjust and invigorate your motivation. Okay, so when you hear the words activism, do you have an immediate sense of out there work, right? Activism is very much about working out there in the community, maybe in your families, maybe in your workplace, but something about there needs to be change and you want to be an active participant in that change, right? Those are the kind of connotations of activism. And then if you're someone who identifies as an activist, after a few years, you realize solid activist work requires inner work, right? So you might feel, okay, for example, I wanna work on being actively anti-racist and you're on board with it. And then you realize that you have some internalized racism that hasn't yet been examined or you're working for gender equality and you realize you have some internalized misogyny or you're working for LGBTQ rights and you realize you have internalized homophobia. And in so doing, you become a deeper activist and a more expansive activist when you start to look at your own inner prejudices, right? So on the surface, it's outside work, but as time goes by, people that are completely secular know you do have to do inner work, right? You do have to reflect within, even with the most secular of activist work. And then as the years go by, or as your education increases, you start to examine things like intersectionalism. And you see the way economics plays a part in the race and the way gender plays a part in that and the way everything is all layered together. And you come to a conclusion that definitely everyone suffers, right? And the challenge is to not make that feel like competitive suffering, right? Who has the most suffering, right? Who's the winner at suffering? Who gets the most attention for their suffering? Yeah. yeah. Even in your friend groups, this can happen, right? You start talking about health problems and then someone else talks about health problems. And at first you're sharing and collaborating and empathizing. And then it turns into a competition of whose body's falling apart the worst right? Or who's getting the least support or whose insurance is the worst, right? So the difficulty with inner and outer work is constantly asking ourselves, how can I see myself in other people? Yeah. How can I see myself in other people while at the same time acknowledging they are other people with a separate and different experience than me and a separate and different background with different types of suffering. So you're kind of going back and forth between they are a mirror, we are the same, and actually we're not the same at all and everyone is unique. It's, it's forever a paradox, isn't it? And then you bring in the spiritual path and in Buddhism you hear words like identitylessness, but still you have an identity. Selflessness, but it's not referring to altruism. Emptiness, but it's nothing to do with nothingness. Mm -hmm. And your head can get a little bit tired, right? It's a lot to process. And so how do you take this idea of inherently, there is nothing inherent. Okay, what? Everything is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises including my own identity, right? Including my own work, including my concepts of what is beneficial and what is harmful. None of that exists self-existently or naturally from its own side. We could take a simple example like offering food to the poor 
And everyone would say, isn't it wonderful to offer food to the poor? We should always offer food to the poor. That is an inherently good thing to do 100% of the time. And everyone says, yes, yes, sure, yes. And then you think, oh, wait, is there ever an instance where that is not a good idea? Is there a time where it is disempowering and allowing people to not develop skill sets that they're finally ready to develop or access other resources that they might be ready to access? Is it enabling ever? And so you could say, generally speaking, offering food to the poor good, but not from its own side. Always contextually, always contextually, right? And then you dig a little deeper and you think, all right, actions and identity don't inherently exist. Also, samsara is not fixable. These are other concepts you hear in Buddhist thought. Samsara meaning cyclic existence or uncontrolled rebirth, right? So the process of uncontrolled rebirth, which is only uncontrolled while it's driven by karma and disturbing emotions, ignorance, for example. But while that's the case, things aren't fixable, right? So it's one step forward, two steps back, you get sorted with something with the environment and then something else falls apart societally, then you fix something societally and something falls apart economically. And it's just like chaos, isn't it? You're putting out fires constantly and then it's flooding, right? So it's a very interesting thing to play with of if it's not fixable, the, con the conclusion shouldn't be therefore complacency but it feels like it should be, right? If things aren't fixable, why bother? If things aren't, aren't fixable, why not just kind of go into my own little cozy cabin and never look at the world and just try and have a happy life and take care of the people in my immediate life and, oh, well, it will all end in flames. Let's just make the best of it and make a good playlist and listen to some music and, you know, pretend it's not happening, right? Which is a totally normal response but is not the ideal response. So you find your way into another paradox with this of if it's not fixable, why try to fix it? If someone has a headache and it's because they have a brain tumor, you might still give them Tylenol. You're not fixing the brain tumor, but you're soothing the pain of that moment. And soothing the pain of that moment might enable them to have the mental clarity to reframe their situation to think about it differently, to open up pathways of empathy, for example, right? So if we can sort of think of our outer work a little bit like <laughs> offering Tylenol to people with brain tumors, that we're not the surgeon able to cut it out at this point in our development. And you know, even once we're fully enlightened Buddhas, we cannot um, forcibly place people into their own peace. We can only offer them better and better, more efficient tools for them to do that. But in the meantime, isn't it nice to help get the edge off? Isn't it kind to take the edge off? And so when we're looking at these kind of series of paradoxes, then the deep inner work is really what we call in Buddhism equanimity. So when you hear the equanimity word, what does it mean to you? What does the word equanimity mean to you, just colloquially? Balance. Balance. Calm. Calm. Impartiality. Impartiality. Yeah. Zoomers, any? Acceptance. Acceptance. Yeah, what do you think, folks? Equanimity. Neutrality with respect to who you're willing to help, so impartiality. Neutrality. With what, who, with who you're, with respect, with what you're going to help. Sorry, I didn't, I butchered that, Roxy. But words to that effect. Right. Um, people that you love, people that are strangers, people that you don't love, as we were yeah. taught in Buddhism. Yep. Exactly. So, the easy misunderstanding to make when we're talking about equanimity is to think that we're pretending there aren't labels. We are not pretending there aren't labels. We are acknowledging that we place people into categories all the time, the biggest categories being friend, enemy, stranger, right? We're putting people in those categories all the time, 
even if we're, you know, a sophisticated person who does not brand people so coarsely and we don't have any enemies because we're a sweet hippie, still we put the, I don't really like you, I wish you were not here so much category, right? <laughs> you annoy me mildly, moderately, extremely, get away. Yeah, or I like you, you benefit me, I enjoy your presence, come closer. Or I don't know you, I'm not sure about you, I'm half curious, I'm half indifferent, whatever. So because we put people in the categories, friend, enemy, and stranger, even if we don't frame it so coarsely, the natural thing is that then we have attachment, aversion, and indifference. That's all right. So attachment, aversion, and indifference is what we're trying to overcome with equanimity, which doesn't make, it's kind of like if someone asks you, what are the best colors? You know that you have preferences, but you know there is no such thing as like a good color and a bad color, right? So you could say, I like red and I like blue. Blue is not red. Red is not blue, but I like them both. When we're working in equanimity, we're trying to see that the push and pull is a little bit like our push and pull towards our favorite colors where we're grownups, we know better. We, we know that these colors are not like inherently good from their own side. We know that we're drawn to them for any number of reasons, but they're not reasons from the side of the color. And then equanimity can sound like you're trying to make everybody beige. Yeah, like, okay, I like beige and you're beige and you're beige and you're beige. And I'm just, I have to like beige evidently, even though I hate beige, you know, and it sounds like a boring, dull life of blah. Having equanimity doesn't mean that you don't recognize you have different levels of rapport, right? You have, you have different levels of rapport with people. Some people you just strike up a conversation, you can go to town, it's a beautiful thing. You're in sync with each other. And with some people you just keep missing each other and it's just not clicking. And what we're trying to do with equanimity is say, that is not the criteria for my affection. Whether rapport comes easily or not, whether affinity comes easily or not, I want to have unbiased goodwill. Unbiased goodwill. So how does that land? How do you feel about that? Like, sounds good in a perfect world, but in your everyday life, probably not? Or how does that land? It seems very logical. It seems does. logical, yeah. Yeah logical possible though does it seem possible <laughs> yes it does seem possible i don't yeah. know how but it does <laughs> yeah yeah so if it seems logical and it seems possible how do you think your way into it in such a way that it's more than an intellectual understanding it's a visceral sense of how you live in the world how do you make that true for yourself without becoming a self gaslighter, right? Or like rose colored glasses, you know, or getting kind of creepy with like a plastic fake happy of everything's good, everything's fine. I love everyone when like secretly you're filled with loathing and resentment. Like, how do you make it true? Yeah, go ahead. For me, it functions by trying to practice compassion on a deeper level. Yeah, practicing compassion. As well as and when you say practice compassion, what do you mean? Like, believe in the, in the ultimate goodness of all beings. Yeah, to believe in the goodness of all beings. And I think of it as a, um, a sort of divine guide mm -hmm. that allows me to sort of soften my, my aversion and indifference that I have yep. also to Christ. Yep. Yeah, so th there was a lot there that was really beautiful, but this summary is, is kind of looking at the divine spark, for lack of a better word, and the sense that there is a goodness in everyone. And I think that that is a huge piece for sure, for sure. What if you don't believe in that? <laughs> <laughs> or what if you think, and you know, and I do, obviously, right? <laughs> but what if you don't? What if you don't? I don't fully believe but I believe that it's the way I, I, I wish to believe in it. Yeah. That itself can manifest more 
Yeah, yeah, that's a good insight. He's saying that that's not yet necessarily where he is yet, but that seems like the logical way to proceed and would work out well. Yeah. Yeah, other, it, like, how do you think your way into it? Yeah, go ahead, guys. It could also be helpful, for instance, if you see, if someone else causes you tremendous grief, rather than hate them, uh, remind ourselves we have caused grief to others. And so we're alike. That's one thing we have in common with that person we might want to hate. Yeah, the, yeah, rather than to think they are the cause of my grief, we think I too have caused grief and in that way are, we are the same. Yep, yeah, that's a really good way. It's a really good way. Um, it's, yeah. I yeah, go ahead, Andrea. Way, yeah, go they, ahead. I think another way is to try to understand the ways in which that person is really suffering and to develop empathy. And I find that that compassion is evoked naturally and then to open up from there. Um, and I, I think that awareness too also takes the sting out of thinking like this person is somehow evil or trying to cause harm. Um, if we can see that they're suffering from ignorance in ways just like us or maybe different, but they're still suffering like we are. Yep, yep, exactly. Exactly. And this ties into the classic Buddhist conversation of how do Buddhists develop equanimity. And the phrase you will hear the most often in Dharma centers is all sentient beings want happiness. Mm -hmm. All sentient beings want to be free from suffering. And at first, you, it's pretty easy to be on board with that. You think, sure, yep, everyone wants to be happy. No one wants to suffer. And then you look at the behaviors of certain people and you wonder, is that pervasively true? Because <laughs> if that were true, why would they do that? Dot, dot, dot. And the important thing to remember with that very simple seeming sentence, all sentient beings want happiness, don't want suffering, is their strategies are different and not always effective. <laughs> Usually not effective, actually, or short-term effective, but not long-term effective. So if you hold that in mind, then that very simple se sentence doesn't sound cliche. It actually sounds very deep where you think all sentient beings want happiness. This person in front of me cutting me off on, in traffic is wanting happiness. And he thinks that this behavior of cutting me off in traffic is gonna lead to some sort of satisfaction in his life. And that's why he's doing it or he doesn't want the suffering of being late. Yeah, and his strategy has a short-term effectiveness and is also really rough on all the people around him. And if he thought more altruistically and if all drivers thought altruistically and no one cut anyone off ever and we were all the friendly person that said, no, no, you go first, that would be a lovely way to live and would lead to lasting traffic happiness. However, we've all been that guy. Right. We've all been that guy who's like, sorry, everyone, I'm busy today. Today's my day to be the jerk in traffic. Zoom. Yeah, even if, even if only when we were a teenager, but probably at some point we were the jerk in traffic. Yes, <laughs> probably. I, and so the question for us becomes rather than kind of like getting into everybody's business and wondering what is their strategy for happiness? What is their strategy for avoiding suffering? How can I figure them out so I feel better about them? That's neurotic, right? And that's impossible because we can't get to the bottom of the rabbit hole. What we can do is say, how is that true for me? And how can I make sure that their behavior doesn't steal my peace? Because I've just given them all the power to steal my peace by responding in the way I habitually respond. And they may not have even wanted that power. Yeah, so there you are grumpy in traffic because they cut you off, almost as if, if you're not grumpy, it shows them it's okay. You have to be grumpy, it's the rule. Otherwise they won't know that they are a terrible driver. And then you sit and you're like, wait, they have no idea what's going on for me. They're completely oblivious. They're totally self-centered. Why do I need to be grumpy? Like as to punish them for their bad behavior or show them their bad behavior? It doesn't work, it's nonsense. And yet there is some weird logic that we have that says, if I'm not upset, they won't know it's wrong. Yeah, which is at the heart of a lot of the activist work that we're looking at. Have you heard in activist communities, if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. 
Have you heard this phrase in activist communities? And I would say, if it's important, it's too important to be angry about. Why? Because anger steals creativity. Yeah, as soon as you're angry, your options become your animal options. Your choices become your default stress choices. If you have a calm mind, if your mind is full of equanimity and balance, you have your creativity accessible again. And all of your life wisdom is at your fingertips again. And you can make the best choice possible for you at your level. As soon as you're angry, your possibilities shrink and you might wind up doing a useful thing. But then when that energy is anger, there's always the backlash. And the cycle of violence, whether internally or externally or societally, it just keeps going. So anger is not creative. It dominates and it can win briefly. But then as soon as you've won because of anger, then what happens to the person you won? They start building resentment. They start fueling their rage and then they become the oppressor. And so it goes from the dawn of time. So even if being angry has an immediate short-term usefulness in terms of making positive change, it's not as sustainable, it's not as creative. It's just kind of satisfying because you won for a second. Do you know what I mean? So this is what we're trying to look at is being upset is natural, being angry is natural, but that doesn't mean it's necessary. Just because it's natural doesn't mean it's necessary. Just because you're used to using it to get off your bum and into the work doesn't mean you have to forever after. It might have been your initial catalyst. It might have been what got you motivated to enact positive change. But now that you're motivated, let's try and upgrade. Yeah. So it's, it's a gentle process and you don't want to pretend that you're not angry when you are but it's about having a conscious choice of now, let's let it settle enough so that I'm calm enough to make creative decisions about this issue rather than my old knee jerk. Because the, all, the other end of anger is also burnout. If you're used to relying on that strong, heavy, boiling, volatile emotion to get you going, it's just a recipe for exhaustion. Yeah, so like this, yes? Um, one of the chats says, um, anger makes you feel like you're doing something. It does, doesn't it? It makes you feel kind of productive. Yeah. <laughs> like sometimes we'll even read the news and feel like I can be kind of disgruntled at the news as if that's somehow helping the cause. You know, I read the news today and I was grumpy about a number of things, did my part, <laughs> right? <laughs> like in what way did that help the process? You just annoyed yourself and now you're a grumpy person in your household and the rest of your household has to deal with you being grumpy because you just read the news. You know, I'm not saying don't read the news. I'm saying read it with eyes wide open. Yeah. What, what questions are arising for you guys? Are you having any yes buts? Yeah, go ahead. I think it's interesting you're using the example of activism in the community because in fact, so many of the people I hold dear who are very strong activists, whether it's myself, you know, my daughter, my most dear teacher, students I've had in the past who've gone into that kind of work. My former professor has been working for the Palestinian cause for the last 50 years of his life, I think. Yeah. His life. And it's incredible how frequently I see real anger online. Yeah, and I remember um, being at a wedding in the Philippines and there was a whole group of young volunteers from South Sudan who'd come in for a wedding. Out of 200 people, and they were the only people who were drinking vodka the entire night. Right. They were all smoking. And in the car, all they talked about was these ungrateful people in the Sudan and why they, and I thought, why are we doing this work if it's destroying you? Yeah extent that you can't even enjoy your best friend's wedding yep without being completely passed out yeah exactly exactly and they're sitting there with the questions exactly did, did you guys on zoom hear most of that activism. 
So she, she was mentioning how she knows a lot of activists and how there's so much anger in activist communities and was giving some examples of that. And, and I think that that's something that we've all seen. Um, I think that the poignance of all of this is that people enter into social justice and environmental justice because they care, right? Mm -hmm. They care, they want things to be better. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things happen simultaneously. And one of them is not understanding how slow it takes for things to change. The other is an expectation of yourself to be some sort of dominant agent of change just through the fact of having decided to be so. Yeah, and so there's a little bit of an ego wound of why aren't they listening to me tell them the truth? And this piece I think is very interesting for us to investigate because we each have our radius of impact. What is our personal radius of impact? And if we have a clear sighted vision of what that is, we're gonna be less disappointed when things aren't going further because our expectations are exaggerated. So for example, there's probably a couple friends in your life who listen to you, who if you say, I read this article and I've been thinking in this way and I really feel like the way we talk about this issue needs to change. They'll say, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, tell me more, that's really intriguing. And they might actually change their mind as the result of the conversation with you. Why? Because you have years of mutual respect and genuine affection years of mutual respect and genuine affection means that they listen to you less defensively. Also, you probably have similar values. So they were 90% there anyway, and you just helped them with the last 10%. Yeah. And then there's, you know, your extended family, perhaps some of which are dodgy, right? <laughs> and some of which may or may not listen to you when you talk about politics. But it could be that they could if you approached it from a relational place rather than a dominant place. Do you know what I mean? Like if you're approaching it from the place of because I value this relationship and because I love you, there are some things I want us to understand and talk about rather than you're wrong, you're old fashioned, you need to catch up, I need to tell you some things and you need to change right now because that works so well, right? <laughs> it works so well when we do that. Or like, I have a moral obligation to tell you how you're wrong, even if you have no space to hear that. And even though it will just ruin the, the dynamic between us, still, I have a moral obligation to tell you how you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. And you know, right? This is how we feel, isn't it? Yeah. Did you want to add? It's bringing up a lot of thoughts. So in the 60s, you used that anger to motivate you and did marches. So yeah. Out there. And now it's more, you get on the phone and you call people and have dialogues around, get out the phone. Yep. So it's less angry, but it's still, how do you motivate people? Um, especially, let's say you mentioned politics regarding a former president that creates way more suffering yep. for millions of people. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I'd like. That's what I have a hard time with focus on a large scale. Yep. When you want to do large scale change and you're used to anger being the motivator and you know that things do need to change and part of you know your energy is coming from anger is completely normal and is quite an across the board thing that we see in all circles. The question is what is effective and how will you know what's effective if you're agitated? So it's not like all of that work and you were mentioning the 60s and 70s and the work that activists did in those days was very much fueled by anger that is very understandable. And maybe there was no other way for them to start or for there to be a catalyst. But from a Buddhist perspective, anger implies the wish to harm which is buying into the illusion of dualism, which is forgetting interdependence. So when you take someone in, and she was mentioning our, our former president um, who shall not be named um, um, <laughs> in a Voldemort sort of way, um, bless his heart, right? But he was not really an agent of love, <laughs> right? Yeah. And there was a lot of harm happening that needed to be addressed. 
And how do you address that without becoming that? Yeah, you address that without becoming that. This is the thing that we want to ask ourselves. And how do you prevent harm with strong means? And what I want to throw back at all of us is that there is the difference between passion and anger. There can be energy, there can be strength, there can be assertiveness, there can be power without even a whiff of the wish to harm. We start to see someone like that as a diseased part of our body that needs healing. And maybe it even needs to be amputated, maybe it needs to be isolated, maybe it needs to be quarantined, but it's a part of our body or it's a part of each other. And framing it in those terms then it's not about blaming or punishing or hurting because if you had a diseased part of your body, you don't want to make it worse. And sometimes it's too far gone and you got to cut the sucker off, right? But sometimes it can be healed if you nurture it in the right way. And there are people that are pretty far gone. I'm not saying that there aren't, but the question we keep having to ask ourselves is if I'm so used to anger motivating my wish to change, how on earth am I changing things for the good? You know, it's like I'm making a recipe out of poison. Go ahead. What you said today about, I've never heard it said before, anger and creativity turns off creativity. Now that is a really profound statement for me anyway. It's like, Oh, you don't have any alternatives, you know? Yeah. And, but I've never heard that mentioned, really. She, she was pulling out that thing I said about how anger kills creativity. And the reason for that is we can go back to just good old Buddhist philosophy and the understanding of minds and mental factors. The definition of an affliction is that which makes the mind unpeaceful, right? That which makes the mind unpeaceful. So anger by its nature is agitating, agitating. And that means your clarity is distorted. That means your ability to see even relative truth is diminished. So how can you possibly be creative? You know, you've just got those couple of little bubbling ideas, which are usually how can I save myself and those I love, or how can I punish those who seem to harm? And it just gets really lizard brain really quick, you know? Yeah, go ahead. You mentioned everyone wants to be happy. My question is, um, everyone based on their level of awareness, see happiness in different ways. Yes. Uh, what is the true happiness? And the second question is, just a couple of uh, practical ways of not to get angry easily, especially on the love ones. Yes. Thank you. Um, she was asking, what is true happiness? That everyone wants happiness and doesn't want suffering, but what is happiness? <laughs> and the other question is some helpful techniques to not be angry. Okay, so um, what is true happiness? Yeah, what is true happiness? I mean, from a Buddhist perspective, true happiness is being free from ignorance and the afflictions and the karma that they've created. So it's in a way like our natural state plus having developed that mind. So you can imagine Buddha nature as like a lump of gold covered in dirt. And the dirt is just habits of anger and attachment and jealousy and pride. And we just gradually washing it off, washing it off, washing it off. And there you've got that pure, perfect gold that was always there that could never be contaminated, but it still needs to be shaped. And it, we you know, say shape it into a Buddha statue, for example. Right. So Buddha nature has these two components, that which is naturally present and that which needs to be developed. And the fully developed form is a completely contented mind that doesn't have, I guess, uncomfortable agitation. It doesn't have a false dualistic thinking that creates this hard separation, us and them. It's the deep contentment that our mind is capable of, the deep joy that our mind is capable of. So I, you know, I'm guessing it's indescribable and the Buddhas could tell us all about it, but it's a deep contentment. So if you wanna think about like a worldly example, do you have those moments of quiet reflection alone? Maybe picture yourself, 
in a rocking chair on a porch looking at beautiful scenery, just a slow rock <laughs> of deep contentment where your mind has just kind of settled a bit and it's, it's let go of the need to be stimulated. You know, there's that, that friction point when you've been stimulated and now you're alone again with your thoughts and your thoughts keep wanting to self-stimulate or they want to read something or watch something or hear something and you're just still cookie monster, yes? But when that kind of release happens and you're kind of back to center, imagine that is like the baseline that happiness can grow from. Does that help? So then how do you develop patience or how do you get rid of anger, especially towards loved ones? One of the ways is equanimity. One of the ways is patience. One of the ways is love. And they all have very accessible techniques that are so intellectually easy that it's hard for us to practice them because we think by understanding them, I should be able to just do them magically when in fact, by understanding them, you can start and then you need to repeat and repeat and repeat for them actually to be effective. So I'll go into the equanimity one because certainly that's gonna help. All right, so we'll just do a little share screen here. Let's see, is that Julia? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so a measurable equanimity, we're talking about impartial or unbiased goodwill for all sentient beings, which means no attachment, indifference, or hatred. So not this like clinging, pulling, not this pushing, getting away from, not this indifferent, careless, not that. And free from that, just this incredibly warm-hearted attitude. And it's important to recognize in Buddhism that we use the word equanimity in a few different contexts. So it's easy to mix them together and get confused. We use it in the context of there's a feeling of equanimity. That's just neutrality. That's not what we're talking about. In meditation, we also talk about applied equanimity, which is um, the eighth of the eight antidotes when we're talking about the nine stages of mental abidance, yada, yada, that story. It's an antidote to a type of um, obstacle that you have in meditation. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about immeasurable equanimity. So to develop this, there's a few ways. So first you think about equality. Yeah, and that's only one of the ways. But first you think of equality and the equality being all sentient beings want happiness or contentment or satisfaction, however you frame it, where you feel it. And they don't want to suffer. They don't want to be uncomfortable. They don't want to be unloved. They don't want to be isolated. Isolated. They don't want to be alienated. They don't want to feel stupid. They don't want to feel criticized. They, none of us want that. We don't want to suffer. And so every time you're feeling the push or the pull or the like flick of anger, attachment, indifference, whenever you're feeling those energies, if you can come back to the equality of what they are doing, they are doing from this drive that we all have. And unless you're consciously training in it, we pretty much objectify each other all the time as if we were types of food. You're a food that gives me happiness. You're a food that gives me indigestion. You're a food I can take or leave. This is kind of how we see other human beings. We objectify them. And so we have to consciously not do that, but also recognize people are doing that to us. People are objectifying us all the time. So if they're being awful to us, they're seeing us as a source of indigestion. Yes, we're not sitting well with them in some way. And that doesn't mean we're bad food. It means their digestion is not suited to our particular brand of nourishment, <laughs> right? Right, you know, and if you frame it in that way, there's a bit more space. It's a bit more humor, right? It's like, okay, I'm giving them some reflux. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you know, I thought I was well cooked, but I'm not, you know, like that. Um, it gives you space to make a different choice about your responses. The other is to think about the view, and this gets into Buddhist philosophy, that all of us have innate self grasping, which means we view this I and then think that it's inherently existent. We superimpose the idea of inherent existence on it. And that creates this friction of dualism all the time. Yeah. 
And then the good side is the potential. And we also all have Buddha nature. We all have the ability to evolve into our fullest potential. The mind is trainable. Yeah. And then the nature of the mind, this is kind of neutral news, um, is that the mind is clear and knowing the stains are adventitious, meaning they're removable. All the mistakes, all the problems, all the silly habits are removable. So we start with equality that this is true of all beings. The ones I class as us, the ones I class as them, the ones I class as human, the ones I class as non-human. This is true for all sentient beings. And suddenly now you feel connected and affinity towards, yeah. And if you think about what is like the opposite of compassion is usually when you say to yourself, I just don't understand why they dot, dot, dot. I just don't understand why they. And then as soon as you understand why they dot, 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 your heart relaxes back open again and you go, oh, fair enough. Yep. Oh, I don't agree with you still, or I don't agree with your choices still, but I get it. And now I'm not agitated in response to your behavior, even if I still disagree with your behavior. So accessing that affinity is one of the key ways that we develop compassion and equanimity, right? That how do you feel affinity for all sentient beings? You think of the way you're equal to them or the same as them. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm thinking through this, and you know, I work in philosophy, but like, so for me, my own like personal path, it's it's about the hardening of a particular intensity of emotion or experience, and which might also be called development, the level of attachment. Mm. So there, it's full of paradoxes, like you said, because the absence of hardened attachment is not the same as indifference. Those yeah. might be used synonymously. So, so for me, for me, what helps a lot is recognizing that uh, that that yes, I exist, and yes, interbeing also exists, and that the human mind constantly needs to classify and categorize things, yep. right? And we do it in, in language itself. Yep. So if I, rec if I know that that exists, and I know that I will have an I construct in my mind, how hard do I want to go when I'm meeting and experiencing something that is, in a certain sense, alienated to me? Yeah. So, the, so the, I'm being really like intellectual. Self, but what I but the, 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 the thing here for me is more of the somatic experience, yeah, <laughs> rather than con constructs or concepts or thought forms. What is the somatic experience by which I can experience a white supremacist when I'm marching with BLM, yep. which I do all the time, right? yeah, or, or I there's millions of examples we all have. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, how do you deal with the somatic experience? Because, yeah, of lack of equanimity. The, yeah. the somatic can hijack and quickly Absolutely. take you to the heart of the state. Absolutely. So interrupt, but the only answer I've ever had, and I, that's why I want to ask yeah. this advice very personally as well, is when my breath can kind of mellow me out. I don't, I don't mean in different, but kind of yeah. push, lower the temperature a little. Sure. And then that opens up, all, all, as you said, creativity different pathways and spaces. For example, what a, a white supremacist is not the same as a human body, mind, and spirit that might identify with some of those things. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, no, and, and it's a really good point that he's making about kind of how do you basically not let your nervous system hijack you, you know, even though you're thinking better, you're not feeling better, you know, you have, you have the scary other in front of you and you're, you know, shaking or you're afraid or you're angry or it's happening, even if intellectually you're thinking, you just want happiness, you don't want suffering, but right now you think that means squashing me. So I'm a little alarmed and fight or flight has been engaged. Yes, or freeze or fawn or depending on your trauma response, etc. right? And this is, it's so important, right? Because we don't want to run over the top of our visceral experience. We don't want to pretend that our body is doing something different than it is. 
even if our mind is kind of in a more elevated place, it hasn't told the body that yet, or the body hasn't synchronized with that yet. Yeah. And so there's kind of like this threefold approach of basically, you do this work intellectually to trigger a catalyst of love, compassion, equanimity, when you're not in the scary situation. But you use a memory of a time when you were that's got enough distance that you can feel it without being re-traumatized by it. You know, so say you have a, an issue with, you know, someone with extreme racism, don't use that one. Use, you know, an, an annoying bully from when you were 10 years old who you've moved on and you're fine, but it was like, it was aggravating, okay. you know, but like, so use a medium level trauma as opposed to a big T, t trauma and work yourself through how was what they were doing, wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. What kind of background leads a person to think these certain things? You know, thinking about intersectionalism and the economics of things and the propaganda of things and all the things that you already know because you're a smart grown up person who knows the things and you're bringing that to your child's memory. And you're kind of releasing that memory and framing that memory in a way where you're able to see the humanity of that person that was once branded enemy or was once branded harm giver. So you can release the somatic experience of the memory. Yeah, and it's, it's like you're doing that with kind of gentle mid-level traumas, kind of consistent, consistently and regularly. And then the next time you've got a big scary happening in front of you, you're not pretending that you're feeling other than you feel, you're just trying to give it space for your new knowing to kick in. And before these events where you know it's likely for there to be escalated emotions, he was mentioning doing breath work and certainly breath work can be very useful. But if you have a tendency towards anxiety, sometimes anxiety and breath work can actually harm one another. Yeah, so if you've got a lot of anxiety and you're already breathing in your chest really up, sometimes you can encourage it to breathe lower. Sometimes you can ground yourself in that way but it's an important self-knowing to check in with because for some people, breath work makes their anxiety worse. But that's not to say you can't do a physical grounding. So, you know, think about your feet, <laughs> think about the way your feet feel in your socks, think about how they feel on the floor, ground yourself with a sensory experience that is not triggering. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for me, it's when something happens, it's just to give a little space. Right? Or whatever happens at any time. Mm -hmm. And to acknowledge that I have a choice. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a choice that can be made at this time. And I, I could try to make that choice to reduce the suffering of whoever's in front of me that's my biggest dogma desire. Yeah. But just to train yourself to just make that space so that you can click in and go, wait a minute, I have a choice on how I act. Yeah. Or you know, what I want to do with the situation. I have a choice. I always have a choice. And and that's been very helpful. Yeah. They, they were saying that just remembering that you have the space for choice is, is a really key and powerful part of kind of unlocking the anxiety and the agitation. Absolutely. Just, just so that you know that whatever is happening in front of you, you can. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's this decision making. And so however it comes out in the end, you actually have a, a piece in that. Yeah, yeah, what did all of our grandmothers say? This too shall pass, right? Yeah. <laughs> all of our grandmothers, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I think then just to kind of like finish that piece of there's the during the event plan, which is very much as you say, remembering to have space and that there's space for choice. But there's actually a little bit of a preemptive strike to do, which is before you enter into the fray, you ground yourself and set your motivation greater good, right? It's not about winning. It's not about dominance. It's not about winning. It's not about dominance. It's not about winning. It's not about dominance. It's about collaboration to the good. It's about healing the wounded components of our society. It's about calling people in, not calling people out. 
Yeah, because this is sustainable change that we're working towards. We've done band-aid solutions for millennia. Let's try something different. You know, so you set your motivation and you ground yourself. And if you can do that with some of your friends, particularly in a rally situation where it's like, okay, the five of us, let's just sit and ground ourselves and like say a prayer, say a poem, say a song, say something together that you all resonate with, right? And set that intention very strongly. Yeah, and then enter into the fray. And then the, the third piece is check in afterwards, right? And, and don't miss the lesson because there's a, there's a lot of things that have happened to us many times and we miss the lesson. Mm -hmm. So what you wanna ask yourself then right after the event in your debrief is where did I stay in alignment with my path and where did I feel myself slipping? And what were the conditions that made that slip start to happen, both internally and externally? Was it seeing a certain type of person? Was it hearing a certain phrase? Was it just being overtired and not drinking enough water? Like, you know, but do that debrief with yourself to reinforce the wisdom that you touched in that moment so you don't lose it and forget it for next time, you know? So do your debrief for sure. So um, Roxy had her hand up, um, go ahead. Well, thank you. Um, I guess in the spirit of this particular activist weekend, Labor Day weekend, um, I was just going to say that it's interesting when you think about certain types of activism, um, you know, one of the key terms in labor activism, which is what I've been involved with for a long time, is grievance, right? Mm -hmm. So you have these contractual kinds of uh, negotiations that, 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 that formalize call out culture in the form of a grievance, right, which can actually help to mitigate an oppressed you know, groups, um, legitimate woes, but it does still, I have learned over the last couple of decades, still create a feeling and an affective, you know, response in the oppressor or the administration of that very word, grievance, right? Um, kind of has an emotional component, which can be kind of unproductive. But I did hear you say that, you know, it's not that you want to forego the dualism of calling out, um, oppression so because you use the word rally so when you go to a rally maybe pray first as you said um i like that um but one thing and the other thing that you said uh, is trying to understand when we when we respond to people in an objectifying way um or, or, or when we say i just don't understand right that destroys our compassion so i've been interviewing friends who are i'll just say his name trumpists um in Wyoming are really with an attempt to understand them because I have a stake in our relationship and that has actually been really productive. So even though I don't think I have the skills to do that with people I don't know, you know, like strangers, I think that that has really helped to develop in me a way of not going immediately to that, um, I don't know, that dualism or that objectification or that, that sense that anger is a substitute for action. So anyway, what you're saying, what you said there really resonated with me, but I wanna just be clear that what you're not saying is don't go to rallies. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I know I'm all for a rally. Yeah, it's just yeah, uh, yeah. contextual, yeah, for sure. And uh, you know, I, I remember um, the last rally I went to was, um uh pride in montana right <laughs> in montana can you imagine oh, um yes. and uh you know and i was there with my mom and my mom and i were there with our flags and we we're like yay it's pride look at the drag queens we're so happy you know and um and we were really enjoying it but then of course there was a, a cowboy contingent you know not like the fun gay cowboys but like the scary cowboys and um and, and you know and i and I, rem I could feel my body kind of go uh oh like, and I wasn't in the parade. I was just sitting there with my mother, you know, drinking coffee going, yay. Um, and so here's the, you know, the, the cowboy contingent. And I, I could feel my body start to lock up, you know, because memories, right? And then, of course, what turned out to be the case is that these totally red redneck looking cowboys just kind of like leaned against the side of a building and then started clapping and going, yay, <laughs> you know, and it was fine. And so it's this memory of um, the body will tell you that things are true because they feel vivid. But sometimes it has nothing to do with reality. Yeah. And it's not like we should ignore that. Because, you know, 
there is a chance that a redneck looking cowboy is going to do harm to people in this kind of event. There is a chance of that. There is a history of that. We're not going to pretend that's not the case. But the lockdown of the body, that was the thing that I needed to unpack afterwards because it had nothing to do with reality. They were just sweet guys, you know, happened to be downtown that day and were like, hey, cool, you know, and they were fine. They were completely fine. And so, you know, you kind of do that debriefing of why do I have that response? Where did that response come from? And also is that response useful? And if they had been ill intended, what would have the right response be? You know, allow yourself to rehearse, even though in the present moment, things are all happening and you might make different choices. Still, it's useful to do that kind of digestion. Stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Are you, are you saying the debrief will help you the next time? Exactly. The yeah, the debrief will help you the next time, but it'll also help you process whatever was traumatic of that time so that if there was a trauma response in that event, it can roll through and out and digest rather than be carried to the next event. Any advice about what to do? Yeah, in the moment. <laughs> In the moment, yeah, your guess is as good as mine now. In the moment, I, I turn to mantras myself because they protect my mind. Um, I go in and in and in, but also it's practical to go, you know, out to look at your allies, remind yourself that you're safe. You know, it's, you have to be practical. But for me, going inward is, is just that tapping of what is it that seems to feel threatened? what is actually being threatened. And any deep dive we can do into identity work is gonna help us be more relaxed at these events because you won't feel like you're being attacked by the words of people who are ignorant. You'll just hear ignorant words. But who are they attacking? You know, so you can do, and it's very useful to do an identity breakdown sometimes. For example, you sit and we can do it just as a reflection, not even a meditation, but let's just do it as like a really casual reflection. And you start with something like your gender. Yeah, your gender. And you think I am this gender based on what? Yeah. Is there anything inherent about my gender? You think I am a lady because of my anatomy. Are all people with this anatomy ladies? No. I am a lady because of my chromosomes. Are all people with these chromosomes women? No. I am a woman because of this and this and this trait. Right, those were socialized and contextual and not across the board in all cultures. Interesting. You know, and you can kind of like do this breakdown of where is my gender exactly? And you can't find it, but it's still there. And so then you're keeping your identity, but it's gentler and lighter. So you can say, yep, yeah, I'm a woman, such as it is, <laughs> but where is it? Meh. You know, if I have a hysterectomy, is my womanness gone? No. But it, was that a component of identifying as? Yes. You know, and you're just sort of playing with it, right? And then you can think about something more cerebral, like I am a smart person, or I am a dumb person, or I am an average person. Feel where your identity lands. Am I smart, average, stupid? Based on what? In reference to what? In what context? Compared to whom? And so you can keep that identity if it's a useful identity, keep it or don't keep it, but you're again, you're landing lightly. I am a wealthy person. I am a poor person. I am a middle class person. Again, context, culture. So do you see how you're keeping your identity while let, letting go of your identity? It's like you're getting breath in there. So if someone says to me, like they say in India all the time, sir, sir, you cannot use the ladies room whenever I want to go to the bathroom, right? And I'm like, I am a lady. I want to use the ladies room. And they're like, sir, sir, you cannot. And um, I, you know, I'm like, I'm not going to flash you, but I am going to go in that room, you know? <laughs> I'm amused because I'm trying to work on not being so identified with any component of my identity. But if I was feeling very much like, how dare they not understand that women are sometimes tall, you know, then I could be grumpy about it and angry about it or hurt by it. But do you see how also I'm not not standing up for myself? I am standing up for myself. 
but it's with humor. It's with lightness. It's with, of course, people are going to have different views. Of course they are. No one's had my identical life. So how could they have my identical opinions? You can think of things like um, identifying as healthy or identifying as unhealthy. You can think of all sorts of things, identifying as having a good sense of humor or a bad sense of humor, <laughs> as being attractive or unattractive. It's like compared to who, in what context, keep it and then lose it. Do you feel what I'm saying? Like you land and then loosen, land and loosen, land and loosen. And if you feel connected to the Buddhist path, you can think from beginningless time until now, I've had countless bodies and countless conditions, and I've been everything to everyone and every kind of anything. I just happen to be wearing this suit of bones and meat right now. It is my vehicle right now, and I'm grateful it's a human one with some degree of independence to learn and deepen my spiritual path. Yeah. So all of that kind of like deep dive in a quiet moment by yourself or conversationally with your good friends who are up for it, that means then when you enter back into the fray, you're a bit more chill. Yeah, a bit more chill and not disassociated, right? Not detached in the wrong way, but detached in the correct way where you have objectivity and spaciousness. Yeah, not disengaged. It's, it's all a lot more chill. Do you have any questions before we do um, a meditation? I have one. Um, yeah, go ahead. If, if um, okay, a situation that I have is, I like to, get, I would like to get along with my neighbors. It's very important to me. I live in tight spaces, so you got to give people space and respect it. But I have a neighbor who I consider is abusive to his dog. And um, I, I'm really having trouble dealing with it. I already know. I already took a water dish over to him. And um, he took it. But then he was very rude and insulting to me. And um, actually reported me to the management. And I, I just let that go. But... I see the dog every day and I really feel for its suffering. It bothers me. It makes it harder for me to do my own work, which I have a lot. And um, I'm just having a hard time trying to figure out how to think of that neighbor, how to approach that, you know? Yeah, and that, that's, it's a good example of having a difficult neighbor who's abusive to a dog, just like we might have a, a difficult neighbor who's abusive to their spouse or who has political views very different to ours or, you know, some sort of behaviors that are not good for the greater good, etc. You know, what do you do with the ones in your face? And I would think and, you know, collaborate with me. But I think that it's helpful to remember that there are a million people who act exactly like that, who are not in your face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who are behaving exactly the same way. And you haven't allowed them to steal your peace. Mm -hmm. Why are you allowing this person to steal your peace? So what I'm saying is the first step is don't let them steal your peace. Because they probably weren't even trying to do so anyway. They're just living their self-centered life with careless behaviors that are inappropriate. Addressing them is based on your own common sense, your own worldly wisdom, the actions that make sense to you given your context. That all stands. But instead of having the strategy of how do I fix this as your first strategy, your first strategy is how do I come back to center? And then second step is, what do I do about this? First step, what do I do internally? Second step, what do I do externally? Right, and we go the other way around, like I need to fix this and then I'm gonna deal with my emotions about it. There are very few things that are that urgent. Some things are that urgent, you just need to deal with it and then you can digest later. But for the most part, there is an illusion of urgency when you're triggered emotionally. And that's one of the key components of attachment is that there is an illusion of urgency. 
this must be done now, it must be done swiftly, it must be done by me and only me. That's an exaggeration and it's not true. Yeah, you're not the only person in the building who is observing the abuse of the dog. It's, you know, anyone who sees it has a degree of responsibility, don't they? You're not the only one. You might be the only one who cares and that is a beautiful and wonderful thing. But the fact that a dog is being harmed by an aggressive or unkind neighbor is not the actual source of your suffering and discontent. Because if it were, then the fact that there are those people everywhere in the world would have upset you far before you ever met this one, you know? So it's that first step of, okay, this is what people do to each other. And this is what people do to animals. And this is a good way for me to connect with the suffering of sentient beings and my own and my own. And all of this suffering comes from ignorance and negative states of mind and the behaviors that they promote. And even though I would never hurt an animal, there is countless people I've hurt probably just through carelessness, not even meaning to, no plan to harm, just from distraction. How many people, how many animals, how many creatures in my life have been harmed by my disassociated state or my careless state being off with the fairies in some way? You know, and so you just kind of like take a minute, managing your calm, also managing your ego that identifies as a good person who would never hurt anyone, because that can come up also. It's like, no, I too have hurt others in out of carelessness. Um, and then when you're feeling a little bit settled and a little less egocentric, then you make your plan, <laughs> right? Then you make your plan based on your common sense and what makes sense in your context. Yeah. And there's a million solutions to your, to your question, right? There's a million things you can do for, for your own situation. But do you see what I mean about starting with you first? Yes, and thank you for that. It helps. Yeah. And, you know, wonderful that you notice suffering and want to address it. I mean, wonderful, wonderful. Let's all do that. But it's, it's about the fact that we are so used to the observation of suffering triggering our suffering almost as if we have to suffer, otherwise it means we don't have real compassion. And when we suffer, when we see others suffer, that's empathic distress, that's not compassion. Empathic distress. Yeah, so your empathy overloaded. Your empathy overloaded, you were able to bear witness, you were able to relate, but then you kind of identified with, and that's taking it too far. You don't have to suffer when you see other people suffering. It does not help their suffering. <laughs> but it kind of feels like we're supposed to, doesn't it? Like, you know, oh, I should feel bad and sad. It's like, no, we should feel motivated and proactive. Yeah. And if we do feel bad and sad, that's normal. But that's not like a need or even the end goal. Right? The Buddhists see the suffering of all sentient beings, of all realms, without exception, and they are completely contented while at the same time being active. Yeah, and the way in which they can be completely active is because they're not pulled down and bogged down by identifying with the suffering. Right? So it's, it's, a, it's work for all of us, but um, let's do a little meditation. And... Um, have a little stretch if you need to for a second, change position if you need to. <clears throat> and this meditation is going to be based on the classic equanimity meditation, but is going to be in more secular terms. So just kind of find a way that your back feels straight and that you feel alert. And if you're in a chair, that's completely fine. Just try not to rely on the back of it too much. And then set a motivation, thinking may all sentient beings be free from attachment, aversion, and indifference. May 
may I develop immeasurable equanimity. And through this immeasurable equanimity, may I develop my fullest potential to benefit both myself and all others. And so start with thinking of a group of people that you identify with. A group of people that feels like this is us, I am safe here. Whether it's a political group or your family or a group of friends. Just feel a sense of us. And think of some of the individuals in that group. Try to see their faces in your mind's eye. Just kind of identifying them as if they were in the room with you. And imagine the type of safety and relaxation you feel with that group of people, the ease of communication, the the relaxed way that you might sit with each other. And then as you think of that group of us, ask yourself, who is them? Who is the them that you feel safe from when you're all together? Who are the ones that are other? And what would it take for that group of them to feel like us? What behavior would need to change? What word choices would need to change? What would make you feel safe with them, whoever them is?
And then you come back to that group of us that is generally comfortable and safe and relaxing. You identify with them. But what would it take for that group of us to turn into pockets of them? What little drama, what inconsiderate word or behavior what would it take for them to shift from the us category to the them category? And instead of thinking of the two groups, us and them as some sort of entity in and of themselves, what if you thought of them in terms of collections of individuals and your responses to them? So when they're kind to you, these individuals, they feel like friend. When they're unkind to you, you feel enemy. When they're not doing anything for you, they feel stranger. And all of this is all revolving around you. You attributing labels, then believing in them. And when you think about individuals, an individual can shift from badly behaved to kind or to neutral, and then you feel differently about them. Someone you considered a friend for years and years could do one or two offensive things and fall into the category of enemy just like that. And if we're talking about what benefits us and supports us, the majority is strangers. Who builds our roads? Who cultivates and transports our food? Who makes our clothes? All of the resources we use on a daily basis, for the most part, rely on strangers. And yet somehow we have indifference. And these people, those people that you might dislike the most, you pick one individual out and that one individual is the most precious one in someone's life. To yet another person, they're a stranger, not triggering at all, really. And then there might be someone who dislikes them even more than you. And so you're taking that very basic logic but bringing it home to yourself. That I'm basically talking to my own echo chamber. 
I'm engaging with my own projections, which have grains of reality, but aren't essential truth. And if we're to ask ourselves what is truly the most beneficial thing to receive from another person, what supports us the most, sometimes it's love, acceptance. Sometimes it's having been harmed and the resilience we built from it. So they don't have to have any intention whatsoever to be helpful and yet still be helpful. And so you take all of that logic and you boil it down and say to yourself, may all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from the happiness that is without suffering. And may all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from hatred, attachment and indifference. Okay, so you can relax your attention. And um, thank you very much for coming everybody. Are there any um, hanging thoughts that you wanted to ask before we call it? So um, Christina is going to do um, an announcement and uh, then we'll call it a day. Thank you again, Venerable Yunten, for your profound insight. It's, it's always a pleasure to receive a teaching from you. And I'm sure I'm speaking for all of us when I say this. Um, I want to make a few announcements. Um, Venerable Yuten will be teaching a class starting this Wednesday. I'm going to go ahead and share the registration link in the chat here. It's the Six Perfections, a practice of the Bodhisattvas. Um, that will be reoccurring every Wednesday, um, and every, every Wednesday evening. And then we're also going to be doing this every Sunday, um, Secular Sundays, the first Sunday of every month. Um, and that should be from 11 to 12 p.m. So keep an eye out uh, for the next one, uh, Public Talk, which will be a Secular Sunday on October 3rd. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for coming. And if you have any questions about the program, um, you can always email spc at medicinebuddha.org.